And the one thing that I remember about working with horses when people would sometimes watch and ask me questions was, are the black squirrels normal? Welcome to If I Were King, the podcast where two friends somewhere on earth talk about the new world order and other things, including, but not limited to, the lizard people. Yeah, no, not enough suffering yet, so <laughs> I'll just have to keep going and make sure that I find some. How about you? I just had a great uh, weekend, long weekend. Yeah, what'd you do? I went to Vancouver Island, we call it just the island, uh, to the Comax Valley to visit some friends, and it was awesome, because you know, you gotta, you gotta take a ferry to get there, and I love ferries, Paul, um, and I gotta hang out with a dog all weekend, which was great. Yeah, yeah. Did the fairies uh, cast some magical spells on you and shit? They did catch ma- cast magical spells, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> enchantment with the the landscape or the oceanscape i do, why do you read my notes paul why do you read no no my i notes? didn't i didn't this time. oh yeah <laughs> that's, that's very accurate <laughs> <laughs> so so tell me about what it what it really says there norman let's compare well paul paul uh, so the best part about the trip well other than seeing my friends and the dog uh dog is named hudson is that uh i get to travel by ferry which is my favorite form of transportation, Paul. Um, and it inspired me while I was on the ferry, when I was in my bliss. Uh, in your surrounded bliss. by the ocean, uh, the mountains, sunshine, um, whales. Um, uh, I, I, I came, an epiphany came to me, and uh, if I were king of the world, I'd make traveling by water a greater part of daily life for all of my citizens, Paul. Okay. <laughs> so the context of that like i just said is i just had a weekend getaway uh to vancouver island and I, and on the ferry um it was actually like on the way there it was very gray and gross and usual west coast weather um but as soon as we like hit the open water we saw some humpback whales which was dope uh I managed to get a little bit of a photo of one. Uh, I guess I can show you. Um, and uh, if you're not seeing this, I'll throw it on screen. But um, it was awesome. You rarely ever get to see any whales at all. Uh, and after we saw those whales, we saw some orcas not long after. So we were we were really in a Shit. treat. We were having a treat, tall. It was great. Yeah. I love the ferry. I always uh, I always go on deck, like the outside deck, even if it's cold. <laughs> And um, I just spend the whole time there because I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. But but my point is that after this, it made me you know realize that I think everyone could do with a little bit more bliss, bliss and peace in their life. You know. So and if and if you had to have water travel as part of your daily lives much more frequently than we do now, um, I think all my citizens would be more happy, Paul. Because traveling by water, you need to slow down. Um, and you know, just take it in. You're at the mercy or the, or at the favors of nature. I I love it, Paul. Um, have you ever been? Uh, have you traveled much by water? Uh, no. <laughs> As a desert dweller, not really. <laughs> I was my next or my question. My next question was going to be, uh, how do we how do we make sure that it's a requirement that everybody you know, travels by water, including us desert dwellers, do you mass mobilize people and forcefully (laughs) migrate people? (laughs) Or what's what's your solution, Norman? (laughs) I want to hear it. No, I don't have a solution to that, Paul. Um, You just, if you're in a desert, you're in a desert, you know. Um, The the water is special because it is where it is, which is on the water. (laughs) (laughs) So if you're not by it, you're just going to have to find your nearest oasis or river. Um, because did you know, I, I recently read on the internet, um, that there was a study, so who knows how reliable that is. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, just being by the water, uh, makes humans happier. And that's why I think water travel is just a very human thing to do. I think it's, we've been doing it for thousands of years. We've, you know, we've lived by it. We've died by it. Um, it was the cr- greatest adventure any human could have you know before flying and it probably still is like it really puts you to scale uh when you're in the middle of the water and it's just you and your boat you know (laughs) yeah yeah. so what i want to do to kind of like make this more possible is um 
I would reduce the number of bridges and I would just. (laughs) 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 Yeah, I would reduce the number of bridges and. um... (laughs) (laughs) Uh, That's good. I like that. What do you what what do you find so amusing? I, about that? I find multiple things amusing about that. Well, for one, because in Albuquerque, the little bit of water that we do have is there's a river called the Rio Grande, but that crosses through the city, and it's a horrible factor for traffic because there are I don't know a limited number of bridges. Let's say. Uh, very limited and part of the reason why is because there's a Native American tribe that has a lot of land kind of in the middle area not in the middle of the city but on one border of the city and a lot of people live on the other side and so they won't permit you to build a bridge on their land but they have a like long section of land that's long enough that you could probably build Or it would be helpful to build probably three bridges on their land in order to reduce traffic. But you can't, so we just have not enough bridges for people to cross the river. And it's just a shit show. A, but B, really what was funny is I was picturing people having to uh, get onto a barge to cross the river in order to to circumnavigate your issue or your idea here. And it was just hilarious and very uh, archaic in my mind, <laughs> picturing that. Well, no. You know what? I'm 100% with your um, Native American friends over there. Goddamn doing the world a service. Less roads and bridges in the United States. I don't think you need any more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We are destroying the planet as quickly as possible, Norman. <laughs> yeah, so I'm glad you found that so amusing and so... Um... It hits so close to home. But yeah, no, I would reduce the number of bridges, Paul. And I would also, in tandem, increase the amount of, like, little ferry services. I don't care how much it will cost the state. I will pay anything for my citizens to be happy, Paul. <laughs> You'll so... pay anything. <laughs> you get rid of all the bridges and pay for ferries. <laughs> I don't know why this topic really is funny to me. Uh, (laughs) I think because it's so difficult to realize this dream of yours. (laughs) No, Paul, it's easy to break a bridge, you know? You just have unique, you just need to break bridges a little so they're not useful. Uh, (laughs) I think, though, the real issue is the social aspect inside of it which is that people would be revolting and rebelling in the streets within, like, five minutes when all the bridges are gone. You don't understand. So first, first the caveat is there will be some bridges left in place, you know, for transporting goods and services and, you know, whatever traffic that can fit. So it'll probably be limited to, like, mass transit, you know, transport, that kind of thing. Um, And, you know, there are some bridges, like, if you need like if it's an island you need a bridge to get there kind of thing um but yeah paul so i i but also i disagree hard with your fact saying that you it would cause um everyone to rage maybe at the beginning but you know what that's what dictators are for Uh, people don't be talking back how i see the economic benefits would would be great because communities wouldn't become so centralized cities wouldn't just become a downtown you wouldn't need those like suburb cities you know each suburb kind of area unit around a city will become its own city and new centers will pop up and people will live close to the home people will you know won't commute for an hour two hours three hours just to get to work because those job centers will move around and the more even you know, distribution. There won't just be a downtown where there's such a huge number of jobs that people have to go to. It'll spread out. So people will have more diverse neighborhoods. Business will pop up. Businesses will pop up in different neighborhoods close to where people live, work, and play, Paul. And therefore, everyone benefits from less bridges, okay? (laughs) So kind of the theory is that if you 
cut off transportation routes and force people to live closer to everything, it leads to better urban planning. Yes, Paul. This is <laughs> this is my dream. Better urban planning. It's a very European dream, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, that's a Eurocentric view. There's so many places that have great urban planning. I like it. I mean, or you could it? just make people swim across rivers and shit too. You, y- know? you know what? There's, so I have seen, I have seen these stories about some people, like uh, I think it was in Germany, like a couple towns in Germany, where there was like some people who would just like throw all their work stuff, their office stuff, into like a waterproof case kind of thing, <laughs> like one of those things that float, and they tie it around. And they just like during the summers they'll like swim across the river. And stuff like that just to like go from home to work <laughs> um so there's there are a few instances of people actually doing this that's a very hippie thing <laughs> dude I, that that guy just sounds like he's a king all right he gets up in the morning and goes for a swim in nature he has to use his raw human muscle just to to go places you know how refreshing that must be first thing in the morning during the summer a dip in the river Ooh, you show up to work you're you're just that boss dog who just swam to work. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> there was um, and there's also a few instances. And in, when I was living in Prince Rupert, there used to be a guy that uh, he kayaked to work every day. Like he like he lived on the other shit. side of town. He would just and he would just throw stuff in the back of the kayak, jump in, swim, go around to the harbor, and just get off. That guy's definitely a king, man. Shit, yeah, that's cool. and uh, there was also I know about this this professor who lives who was who worked I think at like the University of Nanaimo, uh, which is a city on Vancouver Island. He he also like lived on this small island off the off the like across from the city, and he would also just kayak into the city and to go to work and stuff. So there's there are examples of people doing this, Paul. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there are. <laughs> people people would start kayaking. Oh, Paul, like of course this doesn't work on every river, you know. Like if it's too fast, it's too fast. I get it. Um, and that's what the uh, state-sponsored goodies about the um, ferries and whatnot, you know? Oh, yeah. Well, I, I was thinking you could also sponsor lifeguards and just post them where bridges used to be. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, I think that'll be unnecessary. Like swim, bitches. <laughs> uh, the state removed this bridge, so you better start swimming if you want to get across. <laughs> I like it. Right, Paul? I like it. Yeah. So, you know, and you know what? Fitness will go over the, over the roof, bro. Every citizen will be, so many citizens will have, like, athletic hearts, man. Heart disease, yeah. way down. Life expectancy, ex- expectancy, up. Satisfied lifestyle, up, you know? Yeah. Paul, I think, Dude. I think the solution to a lot of pr- problems is just breaking down a few bridges. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's who, a... Who said you need to build bridges to... To make a better world, I break them down. You, yeah, you break them down and post lifeguards and ferries there. <laughs> uh, yeah, I like it. I like it. Too bad the ferries can't just grant your wish to get across, though. Paul, you know, let me talk about let me talk about traveling by uh, by water. You know, um, yeah. Because since you're a you're a desert uh, goon, I don't know. <laughs> goon? <laughs> you're, goon, you're a desert goon. Yeah. <laughs> And you don't understand the tra- the special the special place that uh, traveling by water has for me. Uh, it's great. So I've also um, I had a couple of summers where I uh, did some sailing, like in a sailboat, like for two people kind of thing, and an FJ a Flying Junior. And so I really, really like being on the water, Paul. Um, it's uh, being on the water for like for like as a human. It's I think it's very it's very real and uh, it's very raw kind of like what I was saying you know it's kind of it's kind of a this this natural human movement like physically and like migrationally you know as long as there's been humans there have been you know somebody out at the water trying to go somewhere trying to catch something trying to move one thing to another place you know uh, on boats you have to go really slow <laughs> you know. Uh, it's only in the recent years where we've had really, really fast boats over the last, what, 100 or 200 years. For then it was the winds, or you had to row. <laughs> it has it has an effect of really slowing down time, if you will. Like, you know when you're having a good time and then time flies by so fast? You can be on a boat having a good time and it the time lasts. The time keeps going. You know, it doesn't uh, fly by, even if you're having a great time. Because, I don't know, something about the waterfall, it's great. Um, 
It can also be the opposite, as in like, it can also just be the worst thing ever. Being out in the ocean in the middle of a storm, especially back in the day, you're on a wooden boat. That is, that is how you get the fear of something, of a greater, greater power. That's no, no king can come close to the fear that a sto being trapped in the middle of a storm can bring. The ocean's uh, pretty deadly, pretty deadly. So Paul, when you, when you visit here, we're going to, we're going to hit up BC ferries 100% because they're awesome. Yeah. No, I like it. I've been on the water a bit. I just not here mostly, but uh, I've kayaked here, not kayak, uh, canoe, canoe. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. And ferry trips are special. And I got to see so many whales this time, Paul. It was ridiculous. Yeah. That's, that's pretty baller, man. Yeah, dude. It was awesome. I've never seen whales. I would love to see whales. And orcas. That would be really interesting. Oh, they're, dude, they are a cool animal. They yeah. are awesome. So, Paul, that's, that's, uh, that's what I would change this week is, uh, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd make it traveling by water more, uh, more common in daily life, uh, you know, whether I would, I'll, I'll starting by breaking down bridges, but also just uh, making it accessible to go by water, no matter the price. I like it. I like it. <laughs> uh, yeah, Norman, I want you to guess who this gentleman is. I, I don't know if you know him. Vermin Supreme. Have you heard that name before? Never heard that name. Never heard that name once, Paul. Guess who that would you know be? Vermin Supreme. Vermin Supreme. Uh, it sounds like a wrestler. A rest. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> Vermin Supreme. Yeah, it, that would be a good wrestler name, quite actually. No, he's he's a politician. <laughs> or he's oh, his name is Vermin or Vernon. Vermin. Okay. I, was like... I don't know if you can consider him a politician. I don't know if he's won a campaign. But we'll go over it. Since at least 2004 there's this guy Vermin Supreme who has yeah. ran for president and also for senate and you know okay. a representative. I'm not <laughs> sure if representative, but senate for sure. Several times, many times. And this is, this is, uh, you said this is a New Mexico guy? No, no, he's out in New Hampshire or somewhere, somewhere oh, northeast. Okay, okay. Now, he's run many times, never won. He's an American political satirist who, he runs for president basically each electoral year. And he's known for wearing a boot on his head, uh, the toes <laughs> of the boot face forward. So it's like this. Okay. And... He uh, campaigns on the promise of a pony-powered economy and buying oh. yeah, buying everyone in America a pony. He has a yes. long white beard, and he looks more or less like a hillbilly. Okay, great. You know, one of his quotes that he said was, we can afford these wars, this, that, and the other thing. Why not ponies? Why not ponies? Yeah. I, is this yeah. guy... This guy this we need to get this guy on the show yeah we need to get him in canada too let's <laughs> let's have him run for stuff all over the world <laughs> I, I think it'd be fun so he's come third or and fourth on respective occasions in the new hampshire primary okay like three out of three and four out of four <laughs> yeah third and fourth place in different years you know the primaries in the u.s oh they... yeah the whole world knows about it don't worry okay yeah anyway uh suddenly when, when the, the primary is on american news is everybody's news <laughs> oh gosh <laughs> we don't like it y'all don't need to watch this shit but yeah it's it's also like shitty that it's news in other countries because then you guys get politics twice like twice as much political campaign shit that you're watching which is not pleasant. Yeah, Paul, it's, uh, it's great. No, we love it. We love it so much. Yeah, I would. I would. I just, <laughs> I, I would love it if I could watch another country's, their, their BS as well. That would be just lovely. Lovely. Well, uh, Vermin Supreme, he, he, he now represents the Libertarian Party. Dude, this guy wants to liberate everybody of the chains of their car and replace it with a horse. Yeah, dude. I agree. Let's all ride It's kind of, it's really quite on the theme of your, if I were king in that it's about destroying the transportation infrastructure vehicles and replacing them with something better and more peaceful 
and more connected to nature. And we, we, me and uh, Vernon, we're very similar dictators, except the difference in our election campaigns, if we were actually running for election, which we would not be, but if we were, would be mine is green and his is not. Zero emissions on the water, wind power only, or we're going by rope. <laughs> Are the the horses are more emissions? Is that your idea? Oh, a hundred percent, hundred percent. What about the ferries? No, it would be it would be uh, you know cable ferries like they just they run on an electric motor, but they they're just guided by ca- um, cable and it just goes like. Yeah, but how do you produce the electricity? With water, hydropower. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah, the water <laughs> and and you know there and you know there's some um, there's some fairies. Uh, uh, I saw this on a Scott Tom Scott video where um, there's a few fairies around. If if the river has a fast enough flow, um, you can just literally set up a rope, attach a boat to it, and you just like turn the rudder, and the flow of the water will make the boat go sideways, either which way, because it's giving enough like 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 lift kind of thing like if you're thinking of this as an airplane wing so there, there are some zero um, like 100 you can have 100 percent like quote-unquote clean uh boat travel but that in very specific circumstances but that's not the point <laughs> yeah i was like there's some caveats there <laughs> some important ones okay paul so if you if if you were king of the world is that what you change well so let me let me finish here so it, uh, What he's saying is really, and this is a quote from him, he offers to the Libertarian Party to, quote, troll America on a much larger scale. That was, (laughs) that's his intentions. That is my, that is, um, that is, he has my vote, Paul. He has my vote. Oh, isn't that excellent? Yeah. So other things he said, he plans to put the dental back in presidential. So he carries around large toothbrush, and his supporters do the same. And uh, he is planning on instituting mandatory toothbrushing laws. Uh, some other ideas he's had: zombie preparedness and promoting a zombie-powered economy. Man, this this man is a forward thinker. Oh yeah, dude. He's this guy. This guy is the most progressive guy in the United States, and you don't even know it. Yeah. He's a forward thinker. He's ahead of his time, Norman. It's got to be said. For example, time travel research. That's what he wants to promote. That's one of the things. Wow. Yeah, so he wants the free ponies, as I said. Uh, But, Norman, what I would do if I were king is immediately sign into law all of his demands. Uh, So, mandatory toothbrushing, zombie preparedness, time travel research, free ponies for everyone. And I thought about it, well, why not, while we're at it, make some other fun laws. Uh, with my dictatorial powers, I will declassify all Uf- UFO documents of the U.S. government, <laughs> uh, officially declare war on any and all zombies, aliens, Bigfoots, Loch Ness, and or other monsters. And uh, some funny facts uh, back in 2016, which is when I first learned about vermin, actually during the primaries, I searched how many horses there were on the earth to see if he could actually give everyone a pony <laughs> or how close he could possibly come. How close? Paul, what, okay, okay. I've, I've, I want to I wanna know. I want to first know when was the peak horse population domesticated? Oh, yeah. Here Google is saying... Uh, the U.S. Okay, this is the U.S. God damn it! Fucking always American sources every. Always the U.S. Paul. The U.S. horse population hit its peak in 1920, and by 1930s, cars per capita surpassed horses. So the remaining horse population of four million is now approximately 85 percent smaller than its peak of 25 million. Okay, so in in the ni- in 1920, there were 25 million horses in the U.S. In the oh yeah, in the U.S. God damn it. You had 106 million people in 1920. Uh, so four times as much people almost. Let's assume that in 1920, 25, one in four people can have a horse. And that was like, that was good enough for society to run. Right. Um, how many horses would we need today? 
it was actually a successful pony powered <laughs> economy was possible with one quarter of the popula the human population now a days they're in total on the earth estimated well this is 2017 from i'm going to give you the source cuz you've asked for sources before so uh, horse talk <laughs> <laughs> You're like a uh, fucking former journalist this guy where'd you hear that <laughs> <laughs> horse talk.co.nz norman a very reputable source oh there new zealand <laughs> yeah i horse... i'm sure they have some lovely horses in new zealand they, i think they know what they're talking about dude lord of the rings was filmed there yeah they definitely have good horses i guarantee <laughs> you'll see fucking shadow facts running through the fucking meadows i think they've got good horses for sure in new zealand so norman horse talk very reputable source said in 2017 that uh, there were a little over 60 million horses on the earth uh, that's the entire earth mind you not just the u.s uh, that's hilariously about 270 million horses short of the total u.s population and <laughs> let me also take that a little bit further in <laughs> in reality most horses are not even ponies so it's even more difficult to achieve because you know, most horses are just horses. Most aren't ponies. Nonetheless, though, in my... Isn't a pony like a baby theory, horse? No, it's not, though, actually. Ponies are actually oh. a specific type of horse. I did not know that, dude. I didn't know that until, like, a couple months ago, and my mom told me because she grew up, you know, uh, some of her friends had horses and stuff, so... And we'll be back right after this. <laughs> Paul, do you know what my first job was? No. I was a stable boy. You were a stable boy? I was a stable boy for my first job. <laughs> That's really interesting. Seriously? Yeah, man. It was cool. It was dope. I was like, I don't know, 16 or 17 or something. Um, and I heard that um, some the school counselors helped somebody get a job. And since... I didn't know how to get a job, and today I barely know how to get a job. I just asked them, I was like, can you guys get me a job? And that's how, I, and, and they, I don't know, the guy knew the owner or something, got me a job. Um, and basically 90% of the time just shoveling horse shit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was great, but sometimes I got to uh, throw hay bales around. Um. <laughs> Did you get bulky during that time? Like, uh, I was a very skinny kid, so I don't, I didn't, I definitely got stronger, uh, but not, not, not bulky. No, it was like what two, three months of, yeah, it was great. I got to work about my shirt off. Um, my hands, the gloves didn't protect me enough, and my hands would always smell like horse shit. <laughs> That's fun. Yeah, I bet all the uh, the sixteen year old and fifteen year old Canadian women were like, damn. We smelled that guy's hands. Sheesh. <laughs> Sheesh. <laughs> Did anybody say, like, stable boy? <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Norman. People didn't get the chance. Not many people got the chance to see me working. Uh, it, like, it was kind of like, it was It was actually, it was in, located in Stanley Park, which is like this giant ass park. It's way bigger than Central Park in New York City. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, um. <laughs> And just for context, just for context, um, I don't care. Uh, <laughs> and if I'm wrong, please somebody tell me. But I'm 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 pretty sure I've heard that my entire life. But um, yeah, it's it's located <laughs> like in the park, kind of like near behind some parking lots and stuff. It's beside the RCMP horse stable, uh, the Popo. <laughs> or no, sorry, it's not RCMP. It was the uh, VPD because uh, it's Vancouver Police. Um, so yeah, there was two horse stables right beside it. So not many people got to see me working, uh, but some did. And the one thing I remember about working with horses when people would sometimes watch and ask me questions was, are the black squirrels normal? What? <laughs> That's what, what people would ask. Did they think you're a wildlife biologist or something? Dude, I was a stable boy. I was one with the horse. So they're like, this guy's a wildlife biologist. I'm going to ask him questions. <laughs> basically, basically. Are black squirrels normal to you, Paul? No, because there are none here. <laughs> yes. 
Nepal, there's not many places. So we have black squirrels. There are native squirrels. Uh, gray squirrels are super invasive. Uh, they're just bigger. They outcompete the uh, our native squirrels. Yeah, uh, we have black squirrels. They're very cute. Um, you, you have like the gray squares, squirrels, right? We don't here. We have just brown. Only brown. Oh, okay. Okay. I guess it's desert there. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, <laughs> I mean, also, squirrel racism is real. <laughs> 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 but yeah, no, the black ones are normal. <laughs> so that that was when working with horses, people asked me about squirrels. What was their like perspective or point of view? Like, did this did the do the black squirrels do weird shit or something? Nope, they're just they're just out and about. <laughs> they're just normal squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just normal squirrels. And people have just never seen one in the knife, and they're like, "What the hell is that? <laughs> what? Oh my gosh." <laughs> Okay, well, <laughs> that's interesting. That's really, in or did they think they were painted or something? I'm like, what was... Yeah, I know, like, what I'm like, no, what you're seeing is an optical illusion, sir. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you, need, you need to get down on your hands and knees to be at eye level with them, and then you'll see that they're actually rainbow colored. Uh, it's just the light deflecting from above makes them look black, so they ha blend into the environment better. Yeah, yeah. You're like, but be careful, though, if you get down there and you see that they're rainbow colored, you'll also see that their eyes are demon eyes and their eyes are black <laughs> instead. <laughs> Interesting. These are not Canadian tourists or they're Canadian tourists? Uh, they're not Canadian. But yeah, Paul. Um, <laughs> yeah. That's my cultural corner. <laughs> okay. Horses and black squirrels. Well, Norman, my cultural corner... I wanted to do, uh, I wanted to talk about a local thing because I, I haven't really talked about that. Okay, great. Let's uh, go. And you did last time with the Vancouver fireworks on Halloween thing. So, Norman, the most important and big annual event in Albuquerque, New Mexico, is the B International Balloon Fiesta. It's the largest uh, celebration of hot air balloons in the entire world. There are special, nope. like, local weather conditions and, like, the way the air, I don't know, it's ship. I, I haven't read enough about it or I forgot a million times ago. But uh, it makes Albuquerque a good spot for hot air ballooning. Uh, so there are normal shaped balloons, you know, hot air balloons. And there's also many special shaped ones here that go up every year. It's in... Uh, like mid-October or so, and those include the Creamland cow, which is literally like a gigantic white cow. And Dope. Yeah, and there's a literal, well, well, sorry, there's also a Darth Vader helmet and face-shaped balloon. Oh, dope. That's the one I want to be on, man. Yeah, dude. King of the world up there. But uh, yeah, a giant floating castle that flies through the air. Yoda, Yoda's face and ears and, and ears and, and much more. There's like a bunch. And it, it's the thing, if you grew up in Albuquerque, everybody will know. You remember running around the Bloon Fiesta field and it was the fucking best thing in the world as a kid because there's all the balloons and they're starting to take off from the, it's like a grass field and they're all starting to take off and fly above you. And you go run up to the uh, balloon pilots and they hand out cards with pictures of the balloon and like facts about the balloon and stuff like that. And you go collect like, you know, as many as you can and just watch them take off. And there's also a really awesome nighttime celebration. Is it? So wait, hold, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. All right, so biggest uh, balloon festival in the world, and that's in an, Al, in Albuquerque, or like just outside of Albuquerque kind of thing? In Albuquerque, yeah. Dope. Yeah. And like, so where do they come? Like, they obviously are in fields and stuff. They're not like in downtown or something, right? No, it's in like a pretty massive grass field. Oh, okay, okay, okay. That, that's yeah, too bad. So that dope if they were coming out of like downtown or something. <laughs> Yeah, that would be pretty cool. I mean, they do different stuff uh, around the time that they do the balloon festival, you know, fiesta. They also have balloons take off from like uh, local elementary schools fields. Like they'll oh, cool. have them so that kids can go in the morning before school 
and see that you know it's always an early in the morning so like might start at like five in the morning you know because it's oh the right weather conditions and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The, the sun comes up, the ground starts heating up, and then all the... that makes it a little bit easier for them to, like, get up and float in the air as well kind of thing? Well, it's the cold... it's the relatively cold air that you're a hot air balloon, so it, you know, it makes the pressure system right between the, the balloon and the cold air surrounding it. Uh, right. And then, I don't know, things like that. I don't understand the thermodynamics <laughs> of it quite, but... Yeah, so there's a really great nighttime celebration, too, which is... Uh, the balloons don't take off, obviously, but they just stay on the ground, fixed to the ground, and they light up really bright. They burn off gas, and it just makes the balloons fill up with air and get really bright, and they're very colorful. They're every color imaginable. Every color imaginable? <laughs> yeah. Even spectrums that the human eyes can't see, Norman. Yeah, but they, you know, they have all kinds of colors. So you'll, it's really amazing. Actually, the nighttime celebration is, I, I like more personally now, at least as an adult. As a kid, I liked, obviously, the daytime the most, but. Oh, okay. Yeah, so tell me a little bit as a kid. So like, you, you guys would get up at like five, six in the morning, go watch these balloons, like from that field fly off? Yeah, yeah. You go to the field and run around, collect your cards from all the balloon pilots. And, uh. Yeah, watch them all go up and sit there, relax, watch them all flying all around. And it's really cool, though, uh, depending on which side. Well, if you're on the north, northwest side of town, which is where I live, uh, all of the balloons come towards you. That's the way the air takes them. So where I live, a lot of the balloons land. They're at the end of their travel. And that's where they land is over here, approximately. So you can see them flying above your house. You know, you might see 10 in one day like that if you're up in the morning and maybe, you know, it's the weekend or you took a day off. And uh, so they might land in your yard. They might land near your yard. That's hilarious. And shit like that. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. That's so cool. Yeah. It's like winning the lottery and everyone's like, wow, I wish they landed in my yard. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and uh, it's literally at the like peak and if the weather conditions are good enough, there might be, you know, a thousand of them in the air. That's nuts. Literally, yeah. It's pretty crazy. It is it is the biggest celebration of that type in the world. And um, it's definitely one of the most special things about New Mexico in terms of, like, events, for sure. Also, tell, tell, me, tell me more about, like, the nighttime and stuff and what makes... What, what changed your, uh, your attitude to liking the night more than the the special day i think the nighttime is just mm, it's just really visually amazing and also i don't know the emotion of it and also there's like a huge firework show and stuff so basically the way it goes you go walk under them right um and there's just row after row of like hundreds of balloons that they're just they call it the balloon glow because they mm -hmm. glow you know you you burn the fuel and they so they lift up just uh to stand up straight from the ground and they you know turn really bright red green yellow blue whatever color the balloon is and you walk underneath them and there's this hot air coming from you know burning all of that gas so it's like warm and you're but it's cold october air and you're like walking under just hundreds of them that are you know 200 feet above you or something and you walk through and they're just amazed by like all the visuals and then at the end of that then they have a massive firework show as well which i think is also uh one of the bigger shows in the u.s so uh, that's also like an amazing way to finish off that evening uh so it's yeah it's an awesome event paul when is this event October. Ah, oh, so we just missed it. Yeah. Ah, oh, so we have to wait a whole year before we I can go. Yeah, yeah, you should come, for sure. All right, let's go. October, twenty twenty three, Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. We go. Hell yeah, dude! Big celebration time. <laughs> that sounds awesome, dude. I wanna, I wanna do that. It's, uh, it's like Paul. It's like, 
you know how you're telling me earlier that it sounded like when when you're watching them during the day and it's so peaceful and relaxing almost like they're sailing through the sky almost yeah do you know do you know that feeling and everybody could have that feeling paul Every, everybody could if we just broke down the bridges that cross our river here and we could all just ride a hot air balloon to work except unfortunately the air balloons would fly in the wrong direction because of the air currents <laughs> here but that's okay <laughs> they just take you into nature and you go fuck work who needs it i'm going to sit out here and enjoy the bird song <laughs> so yeah i i like it norman this is a good idea this is a fast track to socialism <laughs> The American public is going to love this. <laughs> you guys' understanding of socialism is fundamentally wrong, <laughs> but that's okay. <laughs> that's part of the satire, yeah. <laughs> you can't be American and understand capitalism, socialism, democracy, republics, or any of the above. <laughs> like, No, no, not possible, not possible. I have a listener edict today, but I think oh, we shit. can save it for next time. Ah, oh, really? We'll save it for next time. And because uh, I, I think I think we good. I think people will have enough to chew on this, this week from our weird ass. <laughs> I think so, dude. I really think so. <laughs> <laughs> You connected that in so smooth. I, it was so smooth, Norman, that I didn't even realize that it was, in fact, like the genuine cultural corner. I thought there was more. <laughs>